Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons, which we're coming to the end of now, has been on the book of Hebrews, entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. And no doubt Paul really thought he was living in the last days, and for him, it was the last days, because it was only a couple years after this was written, we think, that um, he met his end. This is lesson number 13 in that series for March 26 of 2022, entitled, Let Brotherly Love Continue. And let's start as usual with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here to try to understand more of the book of Hebrews. Now, as we come to the end and see Paul's many quick bits of advice and recommendations help us to understand exactly what he had in mind and what you had in mind to inspire us as our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Yeah. Well, look at these comments or comments about the comments of Paul from our Bible study guide, Jim. Paul concluded his letter with several admonitions for his audience to let mutual love continue, Hebrews 13:1 to show hospitality to strangers, Hebrews 13, 2, and to remember those who are in prison, and those who are being tortured, Hebrews 13, 3. Paul also admonish, admonish, admonishes mm -hmm. excuse me, his readers to ensure that marriage be held in honor, Hebrews 13, 4, to keep your lives free from the love of money, Hebrews 13, 5, to obey your leaders and to submit to them, Hebrews 13, 17, and to pray for us, Hebrews 13, 18. Throughout the letter, Paul repeatedly calls on his audience to exhort one another every day, Hebrews 13, 13, to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And as to, and, and to see, not neglecting to meet together, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, <laughs> I, I guess I repeat it, and to see that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and th through it, Yet many become defiled, Hebrews 12, 15. The letter as a whole is a word of exhortation, Hebrews 13, 22. Uh, okay. The well, Bible Center's Guide for Sabbath. Yeah, so you can see that there's a lot of, there's a really brief sort of shot of what the, this lesson is about. And those quotations from the New Revised Standard Version. Mm-hmm. What did Paul mean when he said, let brotherly love continue? We're not only to develop a relationship between ourselves and Jesus Christ, but also we should combine as a group to work together as a church to conclude the work that needs to be done to finish the gospel. We should be proud of our brothers and sisters in the faith and help them in every way we can. We should do for them what Jesus has done for us. How well are we doing today at hospitality, visiting, supporting prisoners and those who have been mistreated, honoring marriage, avoiding covetousness, remembering and obeying the leaders of the church, and praying for the author himself? Those are the things he talked about there just briefly. Let's now go back and, and look at some of those things in, in considerably more detail. Gary? I'm using uh, chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews and verses 2 to 9, 17 to 19. Remember to welcome strangers in your homes. There were some who did that and welcomed angels without knowing it. Let me interrupt for just a second. Uh, if you think, it, we think if you just welcome strangers into your home today, what are the chances that you'd get angels? Uh, <laughs> low. <laughs> you get some bad evil angels. <laughs> you might get some evil angels. Yeah, well. <clears throat> I don't know, we'd have to be a little bit more careful today, I think, considering all of that. We'll go ahead with verse 3 there. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Remember those who are suffering, as though you were suffering as they are. And then we come to marriage is to be honored by all, and husbands and wives must be faithful to each other. 
God will judge those who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Let us be bold then and say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? <clears throat> That's a brave statement, huh? Yes. Remember your former leaders who spoke God's message to you. Think back on how they lived and died and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not let all kinds of strange teachings lead you from the right way. It is good to receive inner strength from God's grace and not by obeying rules about foods. Those who obey these rules have not been helped by them. Okay, we're going to talk about rules about food pretty soon. Go ahead. Obey your leaders and follow their orders. They watch over your souls without resting, since they must give God an account of their service. If you obey them, they will do their work gladly. If not, they will do it with sadness, and that would be of no help to you. Keep on praying for us. We are sure we have a clear conscience because we want to do the right thing at all times. And I beg you even more earnestly to pray that God will send me back to you soon. That's from American Bible Society, 1992. Okay. Um, the best guess uh, from scholars is that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul from prison in Rome. Actually, I shouldn't say from prison in Rome. When his, during his first imprisonment, or first, you know... Visit. His first, not visit, what do you ever call it? He, 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 he was allowed to rent his own house, but he had to be under, under guard. So you call that imprisonment? I don't know exactly, but and but house he was arrest. No, today. You'd house arrest. Yeah. Okay. I guess that would be the right term. House arrest. And so there were three books we know for sure he wrote at that time: Ephesians and Colossians first, then Philippians, and either before or after Philippians, we believe he wrote the book of Hebrews, and then he was released from prison and traveled around for a period of about two years, we believe, and then was rearrested. And of course, that was a time when he ultimately was beheaded. We do not hear very much today, hear very much these days about loving brothers and sisters in the faith. Well, we need to reach out to those around us who are unbelievers or who do not, underst Christ do not understand Christianity fully. What is our special responsibility to other church members? Do we make serious efforts at determining the needs of fellow Christians and fellow Adventists and helping them with their needs? What, what kind of needs do, are we supposed to look out for from, from fellow church members? Well, lose a job, lose a capacity to maintain their family, family rather, that kind of thing. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's unfortunately, today we have government programs that are supposed to be take, supposed to take care of almost everything. Yeah. And sure, given the selfishness of so many people, it's a good thing we have those programs because otherwise there's a lot of people who wouldn't get cared for at all. Now, even so, with those programs, a lot of people don't get cared for very well. But the original plan, as suggested by Paul here, was that everybody in a community was supposed to belong to one church and that anybody who got in difficulty within that church organization would be cared for by the local church. By, in other words, you would help people that you knew about. You wouldn't be sending your money off to Washington and waiting for someone up there to send some money back for somebody. You would be taking care of you know, maybe your family members, maybe someone, you know, a good friend, or maybe a relative of one of your, of your wife or husband or something like that. So it was in the local community. And so there, if you had true Christian people there doing that and being fair to other people, it would be a much better program than some government organized things. It would be a lot more efficient, I, I really believe. Well, I think they're doing that in parts of South America yep. and up in uh, Lithuania and all over the place, they're starting yep. to do this. 
through children or elderly people. Yeah. Well, early Christianity was a real movement. Think of all the traveling that Paul did. I mean, he walked literally thousands of miles in his various expeditions and, and many, many miles that we know nothing about. Uh, he talks about all the problems he had in first, I mean, in Second Corinthians 11. Um, and we don't even know where he was and what he was doing when all those things happened to him. But there were other people in the early movements, other Christianity, who also moved around a lot. Can you name some? Any? Oh, yes. The time of the Reformation. Well, I'm talking about even back in early Christian times, the time of, times of Paul, were there other okay, people who moved okay. around? I thought you were bringing it up the other Yeah. Oh, yeah, later it happened as well. But, but think about Peter. We know that Peter traveled quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, anybody else that you can think of that did some significant... Well, Paul's helpers. Yeah, p people who worked with Paul definitely got, did quite a bit of, ha of traveling. Luke, um, Luke get around. Luke absolutely did. Yes. Paul instructed us to remember to show hospitality even to strangers, and you know the story. Let's just look at that very briefly. I, you know the story of Abraham? Um, and this story really amazes me because Abraham had probably more than a thousand people working for him. And yet here comes these three strangers walking in from somewhere and all of a sudden he sees them. Oh, come. He rushes out and he says, oh, come, please. Can I give you a meal? What, what, what? Of course, it turns out it was Jesus and, and two angels, but he didn't know that at the beginning. Yes. But you would have thought that he would have had all kinds of people there. Well, my servant will do this, my servant. No, he did it and his wife did it. Took care of these people, which I found quite amazing. Anyway, you know that they came to talk to him about what was going to happen in Sodom, Gomorrah, etc. We won't bother to go back and review all that story. But in the story of Abraham and Sarah, welcoming three strangers who turned out to be Jesus and two angels, and then Sarah laughing in response to their prediction of her pregnancy. Now, why do you suppose Sarah laughed when they said she would be pregnant? Because <laughs> of her age. <laughs> because of her age. She was not, didn't have any period, wasn't having periods anymore. She was way past the time for having pregnancy. So uh, we have to excuse her a little bit. But then what happened? God said, yes, when I come back, nine months from now, you will have a baby. And she, oh no, he said to her, and you lied. When I said, did you laugh? And she said, oh, no, I didn't laugh. Well, she really did laugh. He says, well, so laughing at God, did, lying to God, and she made it into Hebrews 11. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course, there was a lot, a lot more to her story than just those, that one incident. <clears throat> so this story of Abraham welcoming Jesus and two angels is a stark reminder about what could happen if we failed, failed to welcome strangers to our homes. Now, I can tell you that uh, we lived in East Africa for many years, and we lived in a place where quite a few people uh, tra either traveled to or came there for, to do various things, and we have had up to 25 people staying at our house. Uh, so my wife was a real hostess and a, operated a hotel almost, so we knew about welcoming strangers in our house. I'll never forget the time when uh, you know, usually everything pretty much closed down, closes down when it gets dark in, in East Africa. And it was probably an hour after sunset or so, and up to our door comes two white men knocking on the door. And, you know, that was surprising enough to, to have white men there, because we, you know, there are very few white men in that area. But, and they, they said, well, can you tell us where we can find a hotel? And we said, oh, no, no, you don't want to go to the hotel. Come on in, we'll take care of you. Well, he says, it's not quite that easy. There are 11 of us. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> the part that made it even more of a challenge is my parents were already staying with us. So we, but we accommodated everybody. They were missionaries from Rwanda coming to visit us in, in Tanzania. I had a school teacher once, and she'd been working up in one of our missions in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And it had grown some, the guys and the girls and this, and they wanted the women up at the night and locked into their own setup. And uh, 
the next morning there were footprints in the mud and uh, anyway they caught up and it was some young guys and they said why didn't you go ahead with what you had we, we weren't game there were a whole lot of soldiers there with their mm. rifles and there were no soldiers but they saw them mm -hmm. yeah yeah there have been some stories like that yeah well why was it necessary for Jesus to another part of Paul's discussion? Why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer when he came to this earth? If Jesus had lived a very comfortable life, died a simple, uncomplicated death, would we think that he was not really like one of us? Instead, God planned for Jesus to live a life like ours and harder. And he could have mentioned that Satan and all his evil angels did everything they possibly could to make the life of Jesus difficult, even impossible. And I have mentioned this several times, but I'm going to mention it again right now. Satan had three goals that he, he pursued during the life of Jesus. First of all, he said, no human being has lived on this earth without sinning at some point or another. I'm going to get this baby to sin. He failed. As it was drawing near the end of Christ's life and he realized that he had not sinned, Satan said, well, let me just make life so difficult for him that he'll give up and go back to heaven. He doesn't have to sin, just abandon what he's doing here and just go back to heaven. He failed in that one. And then when Jesus was finally dead and buried in the tomb, he and all of his angels were there at that tomb trying to keep it shut and they couldn't. So three things that Satan tried to accomplish during the life of Jesus, and he failed in all of them. Well, what should be the proper relationship of members of Seventh-day Adventist Church to those who are in prison? Uh, you know, church is doing that very thing right now. If you mm -hmm. look at the uh, one of the local Adventist uh, TV stations, and yeah. they've gone in there and both at one time had been in there and got converted. Yeah. And uh, they, they you know, out there and all the time they can. It's, it's, our prisons are a lot more complicated than they were back in Paul's day. Yeah. Um, you have to get all kinds of special permissions and so forth to go in there and you must have a, a very specific reason for going in there and so forth. But like you say, there are ministries that serve prisoners run by the church in many places. There's a huge prison ministry in Zambia where I used to live, used yeah. to work, and so forth. But uh, it's for men and women. Yeah, you just can't you can't just sort of walk into prison and minister. You have to be well, uh, take some that. doing. Well. Um, Paul was aware that his audience had suffered loss of possessions that had even been threatened with death, and some of them had died. There are wonderful prison ministries in some parts of the world that, uh, that have brought many people to the Lord, and you've just heard about a couple of them. But it's not easy in the United States these days to visit people in prison. Still, should we be taking the necessary steps to visit prisoners in our day? Was it Paul's intention that every church member should try to visit prisoners? If not, who specifically should attempt to do that? Should uh, each church have a group of people who would work on visiting prisons? Well, not every church is located anywhere near prison. Right. So. And I think it's more of an, an experienced uh, adult person too. Yeah, clearly. Well, Paul, Paul was writing to a group of young men, probably some or all of whom had come out of a very pagan and sexually promiscuous environment. So as part of his concluding remarks, he admonished them to keep sacred their Christian marriage, Hebrews 13, 4 and 5. Paul recognized that illicit sexual relationships and greed are two great threats to brotherly love. Dwayne? In addition, Greco-Roman society was lax in regard to sexual ethics. A double standard was common. This allowed men license in their sexual relationships as long as they were discreet. Paul warns, however, that God will judge adulterers. Believers should not let social conventions establish their own ethical standards. Yeah, can you imagine how many different ethical standards would be 
or are existent in our world today in different places. So many, uh, there's some places in Africa, it's only wrong if you get caught. Yeah. That's true just about everywhere, isn't it? <laughs> well, most of us think that, you know, doing something wrong isn't, is wrong, whether or not we get caught. <laughs> but are we ever inclined to let social conventions influence us? Could this be one of Satan's most successful temptations? In our day, it's so easy to bring all kinds of very unchristian influences into our homes through television and the internet. What kind of standard should we maintain with reference to these persistent evils? Well, that's a subject we could discuss for a long time, right? Yes. Who, do, who yeah. decides? Romans 14? Yeah, right. Remember not of faith? Leave them off as much as you can. Yeah. Well, however, in this context, Paul recognized an important fact. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, in the letter that I wrote you, I told you not to associate with immoral people. Now, I did not mean pagans who are immoral or greedy or are thieves or who worship idols. To avoid them, you would have to get out of the world completely. I mean, and, you know, look at our world today. How could you, I mean, billboards and all kinds of stuff that are yes. really would be considered immoral. You can't. What I meant was that you should not associate with a person who calls himself a believer, but is immoral or greedy or worships idols or is a slanderer or a drunkard or a thief. Don't even sit down to eat with such a person. Now, how does that fit with what I read just a little while earlier about welcoming strangers? Well, or, or helping brothers in the, in, the, in the church or in the faith. Mm-hmm. One of the issues that is touched on in this lesson that could raise a lot of questions in our day is the question of homosexuality. How should we relate to homosexuality in light of the following verses? Jim? First Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Surely you know that the wicked will not possess God's kingdom. Do not fool yourselves. People who are immoral or who worship idols are, or are adulterers or homosexual perverts or who steal, are greedy, or are drunkards, or who slander others, or are thieves. None of these will possess God's kingdom. Good News Bible. You want to go ahead? Ephesians 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 5. You may be sure that not, no one who is immoral, indecent, or greedy, for greed is a form of idolatry, will ever receive a share in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Good News Bible. 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. It must be remembered, of course, that laws are made not for good people, but for the lawbreakers and criminals, for goodness, for the godless and sinful, for those who are not religious or spiritual, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, for the immoral, for sexual perverts, for kidnappers, for those who lie and give false testimony, or who do anything else contrary to sound doctrine. Revelation 12, excuse me, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. God, the one who sits on the throne, said, but cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, murderers the moral, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars. The place for them is the lake of fire, of burning. lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Good news, Bible, Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse fifteen. But outside the city are perverts and those who practice magic, the immoral and the murderers, those who worship idols and those who are liars, both in words and deeds. Okay, here's a quick trivia question. Revelation 22, 15. What time period are we talking about there? Well, that's after. After what? After the, the second, it's the third, third coming. coming. This happens at the third coming, right, yeah. where the righteous will be inside the city and the wicked will be outside the city, yeah. And there's a good portion of the Christian persuasion that don't understand that, am I yeah. correct? That's correct. The other major problem that Paul recognized was the love of money. Now, nobody here has any love for money, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Not to the extent some do. <laughs> okay, Carrie, you want to read First Timothy 
Yes. For the love of money is the source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. And that's from the Good News Bible. So what did Paul, Paul suggest in his many writings about how we should relate to the love of money? First of all, we should be content, content with what we have. However, more than that, we should embrace God's promise so that he will never leave us or forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5. Where should we draw the line between being prepared for emergencies that might come in our lives or even preparation for retirement versus hoarding money? And uh, that's a very present situation for me because I just recently retired. So do I have enough money stored up for some way of taking care of myself? Well, should some dads feel that they do not need to prepare financially for retirement or prepare for family emergencies? Dwayne? Second Corinthians 9, 8 reads, and God is able to give you more than you need so that you will always have all you need for yourselves and more than enough for every good cause. Go ahead. And in Philippians 4, 11 and 12, and I am not saying this because I feel neglected, for I have learnt to be satisfied with what I have. I know that it is to be in need, I, I know what it is to be in need, and what it is to have more than enough. I have learnt this secret, so that anywhere, at any time, I am content, whether I am full or hungry, whether I have too much or too little. Okay, in light of this advice from Paul, it is interesting to realize that if one pays close attention to the work of the advertising agencies which dominate our Western world, one would think that, we've just talked about sex and we've just talked about money, you would think that sex and money are the main attractions in life. I mean, the advertising agencies, what do they, what do they, what do they use to motivate, try to motivate people? Yeah. Wow. There's an interesting contrast between instructions given to Moses to be passed on to Joshua and what the people themselves later said to Joshua. Look at, look at this as a, in light of what we just read. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 to 8. Moses, speaking to the people of Israel, said, Be determined and confident. Do not be afraid of them. Your God, the Lord himself, will be with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. Now, of course, Moses is giving them instructions about fighting their way and entering into the promised land and so forth. If they had followed God's original instructions that gave us in Exodus 23, they wouldn't have, to, wouldn't have had to worry about anything. But uh, anyway, then Moses called Joshua and said to him, in the presence of all the people of Israel, be determined and confident. You are the one who will lead these people to occupy the land that the Lord promised to their ancestors. Lord himself will lead you and will be with you. He will not fail you or abandon you, so do not lose courage or be afraid. And after that, when Joshua took over, God said, Joshua, no one will be able to defeat you as long as you live. I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will always be with you. I will never abandon you, from the Good News Bible. And then, now we, we saw what God said to Moses. We saw what God said to Joshua. But notice what the people said to Joshua. Joshua 1, 16 to 18. They answered Joshua, We will do everything that you've told us. We'll go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we always obeyed Moses. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if Joshua collapsed just when he heard that or... Man, for more than a short time, did the people obey Moses or Joshua or God? Yeah, but we need to finish that, uh, that yeah. chapter there. So I'm, uh, I'm, you're I'm coming to it? <laughs> I'm going on. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever questions your authority or disobeys any of your orders will be put to death. Be determined and confident. <laughs> and be of, yeah, be of good cheer. <laughs> yeah, well, so God has said to Moses, God said to Moses, be determined and confident. God said to Joshua, be determined and confident. And now the people are saying, if anybody gets in the way, kill them. Be determined and confident. Well. Stonings will continue until. Moral and. Morality. <laughs> <laughs> until the 
Mora. Until mo morale improves? No, it morale improves, improves yeah. Morale, yeah. <laughs> Paul addressed a question about how we should relate to church leadership. Reading from Hebrews 13, some of which we read earlier. Jim, Hebrews 13, 7 to 17, can you do that for us? Remember your former, excuse me, remember your former leaders who spoke God's message to you. Think back on how they lived and died and in, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not let all kinds of strange teachings lead you from the right way. It is good to receive inner strength from God's grace and not by obeying rules about foods. Those who obey those, these rules have not been helped by them. Obey your leaders and follow their orders. They watch over your souls without resting, since they must excuse me, since they must give God an account of their service. If you obey them, they will do their work gladly. If not, they, they will do it with sadness, and that would be of no help to you. So now, what, who are those leaders that were that they're ta he's referring to? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next. What could we as individual Seventh-day Adventist Christians do to strengthen and improve the leader membership relationship to our congregations and denominations throughout the world? Now, we're we talking here about the local pastor. We're talking about the local conference leaders. We're talking about the union leaders, the division leaders, the general conference. Well, I think all of them. All of the above, yes. huh? Yeah. And, and well, so what are we going to do? Deacons in the church. It's yeah. Sometimes there's verbal brawls going be behind the whole thing. I've seen that happen. So you think we need to well, at least respect all of them, right? Yeah. Have they set a standard that is worth emulating? So that's the next question. Carrie? There's a 22 there. Mm -hmm. Have they set a standard that is worth emulating? For Paul, the greatest act of remembrance and praise What's that? Something's miss. Oh, he is. I'm oh, sorry. Something else. Uh, okay. My little cur cursor was in the way there. Yeah. His emulation. In this way, Paul has added the founding leaders of the congregation to the list of faithful heroes whom believers should carefully consider. This list includes the heroes of faith of Hebrews 11 and Jesus, the consummate example of faith in Hebrews 12. The author further notes that Jesus is, quote, the same yesterday and today and forever, unquote. And that's from Hebrews 38, 13, 8, rather. He stands in stark contrast to false teachers who change with time and whose teachings become, quote, various, unquote, and strange, quote, and unquote, Hebrews 13, 9. And... Uh, that's what the new something by King James. New King James, James. That's right. To call the, to remember the leaders in Hebrews thirteen seven is restated in more forceful terms at the end of the section. Believers are exhorted to obey the leaders, because they watch out for their souls. The leaders are described here as pastors who are in charge of the spiritual well-being of the congregation, their flock. Uh, and who will give an account to God for their spiritual state? See also 1 Peter 5, 1-4, 1 Corinthians 3, 10-15. Certainly, too, the idea should apply to all our church leaders as well as at all levels of the denomination today. And that's from an adult Sabbath school Bible study guide for Tuesday, March 22. Okay, so they came to more or less the same conclusion that we did, that we should respect church leaders, huh? Yes. Paul warned against strange and diverse teachings. Reading again Hebrews 13, 9. Dwayne? Uh, Hebrews 13, 9. Do not let all kinds of strange teachings lead you from the right way. It is good to receive inner strength from God's grace and not by obeying rules about foods, those who obey these rules have not been helped by them. So now we need to look at some very interesting statements from Paul. What do you think Paul was referring to when he talked about strange and diverse teachings? 
Some have suggested that he was perhaps speaking about the differences between clean and unclean meats. Think that could be the case? Well, there are several reasons to believe that this was not his main subject. In order to understand what was going on at that general conference meeting in Jerusalem, it's recorded in Acts 15, and let's talk about that really quickly. Remember that after Paul and, and Silas had gone out and Barnabas earlier, and they came back, and it, the word got to Jerusalem that these people are out there converting a bunch of Gentiles and inv inviting them to become members in the church. And that was almost a taboo to the church leaders back, and these were even our disciples back in Jerusalem, they weren't too sure about this business. And so they called a general conference, and Paul and Silas went, and Barnabas and others, what should we do about these Gentiles who are joining the, the Christian church? Well, they, find, they finally ended up, after a long discussion, um, uh, the, the question then became, should those non-Adventists believe, this was the, when it finally boiled down, okay, should the, those non-Jewish believers be required to practice circumcision and follow all the other traditional Jewish requirements before they could become Christians? And the real question is, would they be allowed to attend church and sit da down next to a Jewish, a formerly Jewish Christian, you know? Do I want to be content? Well, remember what Jesus talked about, you know, they would go through the elaborate process of washing hands after coming back from the market. You bought some vegetables in the market. Maybe these vegetables were touched by a Gentile. Well, now imagine going to church and sitting right next door, to, right next to a Gentile. Can you, can you do that? Well, that's what, that was the big question. The very legally oriented church leaders from Jerusalem felt that was an absolute necessity. These people need to be Jews before they can become Christians. Paul, recognizing the truth and having worked with people from other parts of the world, insisted that following those Jewish practices were not necessary. And look, listen to the Pharisee of the Pharisees talking here, right? Yes. So the purpose of the conference was to determine whether or not Gentile Christians could be welcomed into church fellowship with former Jews who still had scruples about their Jewish practices. And here's a couple of passages about all of that. Acts 15, 7 to 11. After a long debate, Peter stood up and said, My brothers and sisters, you know that a long time ago, God chose me from among you to preach the good news to the Gentiles so that they could hear and believe. Now, can you think of a very obvious case where when, Jesus, when Peter spoke and, and to, to some Gentiles and converted them? Peter went up to a place on the coast of the Mediterranean to a place called Caesarea Maritima and converted Cornelius, yes, yes. Acts 10, and they, they, they received the Holy Spirit right there and began to speak in tongues. Wow. Well, Peter goes on to say, and God who knows the thoughts of everyone showed his approval of the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he had to us with the tongues of fire at Pentecost. That's pretty amazing. He made no difference between us and them. God, that is, made no difference between us and them. He forgave their sins because they believed. So then, why do you now want to put God to the test by laying a load on the backs of the believers, all the ceremonial laws, including circumcision, which neither our ancestors nor we ourselves were able to carry? No, we believe and are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. Wow. How's that for a speech? That's a good one. Yeah. Acts 15, 19 and 20. It is my opinion, James went on. And so now in conclusion, James is going to give us some instructions, okay? Uh, that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them not, to, okay, here are the directions, not to eat any food that is, that is ritually unclean because it has been offered to idols. So there's a very important thing. Are you all carefully following that instruction? to keep themselves in sexual immorality, that might be more of a problem in our day, 
and not to eat any animal that has been strangled or any blood. Those are the directions. So what would you say? Are, this is a conclusion at the end of the first general conference session. Are these the beliefs for which one is saved in our day? Certainly not. These are the minimum nece minimal necessities to follow so that the former Jews would be willing to sit next to a Gentile convert and church and not be repulsed. Okay. So how should we understand Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 in this context? Well, you know what happened, don't you? Paul went out. He took his friend Silas. And after ministering in Antioch for a while, they went off for another missionary journey. And when he was down at Corinth, he thought to write a letter to the Romans because he was planning to go and visit the church in Rome. And this is what he said, Romans 14, 1 through 10. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. Oh dear, that might be me. Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't, while those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who will eat anything, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Servants. Is there, it, it is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail. And they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days. Do any of us think that one day is more important than other days? While others think that all days are the same, we should each firmly make up our own minds. Is that how we decide doctrines in our day? Those who think highly of a certain day do so in honor of the Lord. Those who will eat anything do so in honor of the Lord because they give thanks to God for the food. Those who refuse to eat certain things do so in honor of the Lord and they give thanks to God. None of us lives for himself only. None of us dies for himself only. If we live, it is for the Lord that we live. If we die, it is for the Lord that we die. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For Christ died and rose to life in order to be the Lord of the living and of the dead. You then, who eat only vegetables, which had not been offered to idols, that's why they were uh, people who weren't too sure whether it was safe, they were able to eat the best vegetables because they hadn't been offered to idols. Why do you pass judgments on others? And you who eat anything, knowing that the idols to which the meat had been offered, has been offered, have no power over us or over the meat, why do you despise other believers? All of us will stand before God to be judged by him. And then two chapters later, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 11, 1, he gives a conclusion. We are allowed to do anything, so they say. That is true, but not everything is good. We are allowed to do anything, but not everything is helpful. None of you should be allowed, you should be looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Now he comes to his conclusion. You are free to eat anything sold in the meat market, whether asking any questions, without asking any questions because of your conscience. Now, this isn't talking about cholesterol, not talking about healthy, anything like healthy or stuff. It's talking about your conscience. Are you able to eat food that's been offered to idols, or do you think it's contaminated? For as the scripture says, the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you decide to go eat what is set before you without asking any questions because of your conscience. Hmm, wow. But if someone says to you, this food is offered to idols, then do not eat that food for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience's sake, conscience's sake. That is not your own conscience, but for the other person's conscience. Well, then someone asks, why should my freedom to act be limited by another person's conscience? If I thank God for my food, why should anyone criticize me about food for which I give thanks? Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory live in such a way as to cause no trouble either to Jews or Gentiles or to the Church of God. Just do as I do. I try to please everyone in all that I do, not thinking of my own good, but of the good of all, so that they might be saved. Imit and now Paul goes to the final conclusion of verse, chapter 11, verse 1. 
imitate me then just as I imitate Christ. Wow, would we dare to say that? That's, isn't that Philippians what, yeah. uh, 2, 5? Yeah. Uh, that this might be in use in Christ. Yeah. In other words, think, uh, another way of saying it is think like Jesus. Mm -hmm. It isn't that you believe in Jesus. Uh, you, you want to believe what and how Jesus believed. Yeah. Reading more broadly in the New Testament, it is very clear that following what Jesus said in John 6, we can set aside all the formerly Jewish rituals and customs because grace comes directly from God. We can approach him at his throne in heaven as if we are priests. And why do we say as if we are priests? Well, there's, there's, isn't that what God wanted? Everybody yeah. be a kingdom of priests. It says that in, way, way back in Exodus and it's repeated by Peter yeah. in the New Testament. We are a kingdom of priests. Jesus, our faithful high priest, has led the way into the throne room of God himself. He's led the way. What does lead the way mean? Are we supposed to follow? This will protect us from being led astray by strange teachings. Okay, Jim? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives. It is safe and sure and goes through the curtain of the heavenly temple into the inner sanctuary. On our behalf, Jesus has gone in there before us and has become a high priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Okay, reading Bible. on more from Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verses 10 to 14. The priests who serve in the Jewish place of worship have no right to eat any of the sacrifice on the altar, on our altar. Let's, let's stop and... Now, you, you know that there were some things that the priests were allowed to eat and some things they were not. And of course, Paul is writing to a group of people who are probably very familiar with all those details. But, um, you know, he's just following along and hopefully they, they understood. And I'm, we don't have time to go through each of the individual sacrifices to talk about who's allowed to eat some and who's not allowed to eat some. But some they could and some they couldn't. So go ahead. The Jewish high priest brings the blood of the animal into the most holy place to offer it as a sacrifice for sins. But the bodies of the animals are burned outside the camp. For this reason, Jesus also died outside the city in order to purify the people from their sin with his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and share his shame. For there is no permanent city for us here on earth. We are looking for the city which is to come. Good News Bible. And I should just mention in, in just briefly here, there were two things that the Jews were not supposed to eat. Do you remember what they were? We already mentioned one when we talked about the conclusion to the Acts 15 conference. What were they not to eat? Swine. Well, no, that was that was the yeah okay. I, I wasn't yeah. Animals that were strangled. Okay, and why was that? It has the blood in it. Yeah, still. still has the blood in it. So they were not to eat blood, and they were not to eat fat. And why were they not to eat blood and not to eat fat? Do you know? Not healthy for them. Well, it wasn't healthy, <laughs> but the real reason why they weren't to eat them is because that's where the flavor is. Yeah. In the meat. So God didn't want them to get the idea that we just eat this meat because it's tasty and we're gonna eat more of it because it's more tasty and so forth like that. He says, if you need it for protein, that's fine. If you wanna prove that to yourself out there, take a little piece of meat, boil it for a few minutes, take it out, squeeze it, squeeze all the juice out of it, boil it again for a little bit, take it out, squeeze it a little bit. So you've got all the juices out, there's nothing but the pure protein left and see how much flavor is left. Much. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 28, it is well known that Jesus was crucified outside of the city wall. Bible writers compare their, that experience with the admonition of Old Testament times that anything defiled, excuse me, defiling should be done outside the camp. What is the reason for this admonition? I guess that, that was a point 28 yeah. rather than verse 28. Go, Go ahead. ahead. The place outside the gate was the most impure of the whole camp. The carcasses, now, go ahead. Let me just interrupt for a second. Do you remember what that place outside the gate was called? 
Don't, oh no, the dung gate, one of, one of the gates? Well, there's a dung gate, yeah, but that's not the one that really, <laughs> although that might have been, might have been there too. No, that, that's a place that's called Gehenna. Yeah, yeah. The, the word is often well, translated fire, The dumps were always bur yeah. burning. It Continuously always on fire, burning and burning, 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 so forth. And so that's where we get some of our, people get some ideas about hell from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. The carcasses of the sacrificial animals were burned there, Leviticus 4, verse 12. Lepers were all were excluded from the camp, Levi Leviticus 13, 46, and blasphemers and other criminals were executed there, Le Leviticus 24, verses 10 to 16 and 23, 1 King 21, 13, and Acts 7, 58. These regulations presuppose that the presence of God was within the camp. Anything that was impure was cast outside because God was unwilling to see any unclean or indecent thing in it. Numbers 5, verse 3, Deuteronomy 23, verse 14, from the ad, Adult and, Sabbath School. And if you're yeah. familiar with the writings of Moses, there's several times in his in, in Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy when someone became impure, even Miriam, when she got leprosy because of complaining against Moses, remember? What happened to her? She they was outside the, the camp. They put her outside the camp. So that was a standard procedure. Nothing uh, impure was supposed to be inside the camp. And so Jesus was crucified outside of, the, of Jerusalem because he was regarded as a? Sinner. Sinner, or to the Roman government, he was a traitor, a traitor. You know, criminal. Yeah. Are we prepared to suffer shame because of our beliefs? Are we embarrassed to be known as Seventh-day Adventists? I can remember the time many years ago when I worked a summer, <clears throat> worked for a summer as a call porter. And it was almost, you know, we were almost taught. Well, I come from the Home Health Education Service. And it, well, what church? Well, we're here just to represent the truth. Da, da, da. Almost, it was almost a, you know, you, oh, well, I guess I have to tell you, I'm an, oh no, don't tell them you're an Adventist. What about that? Let me get you mixed by, with some other persuasions, too. Yes. <laughs> it is interesting to remember that back in the days just after the exodus from Egypt, God chose to have his sanctuary placed in the very center of the Hebrew encampment. And then, I guess, Kip, Carrie, you could take that next one? Yes. Uh, paradoxically, However, Hebrews suggests that God's presence is now outside the camp. And why would that be? What, what, where was the camp in, in Jesus' day? The place where the temple was located, etc. That was the city of Jerusalem, wasn't it? Yeah. That was considered to be the, the center place. And had those people carefully followed and were they doing everything that God wanted them to do? No. Not at all. They had defiled the camp. So what did God do when the camp was defiled? Even in the Old Testament times, he said, move my tent outside of the camp because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So here we see it. Okay. Uh, the action of following Jesus outside the camp means not only bearing his reproach or shame, but also going forth to him uh, and I quote Hebrews 13:13, 13, 13. just as those Israelites who sought the Lord went outside the camp in the desert when Moses removed God's tent from the camp after the golden camp, calf controversy, that's Exodus 33, verse 7. Uh, this account suggests that the rejection of Jesus by unbelievers also implied the rejection of God, as Israel did in the golden calf apostasy. From that, Exodus 32, Exodus 33. Thus, the path of suffering and shame also is the path to God. That's our old Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, March 24. So if... <coughs> Faithfully following God causes you to leave what should be the, the ritually pure place. You have to go outside, right? 
As Christians, we are admonished to leave behind the corrupting influences of the world in which we live. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, um, believers rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ had enjoined upon them. By unselfish words and deeds, they strove to kindle this love in other hearts. But gradually a change came. The believers began to look for defects in others. <clears throat> Dwelling upon mistakes, giving place to unkind criticism, they lost sight of the Savior and His love. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular in about the theory that the practice of, than the practice of, of the faith. In their zeal to condemn others, they overlooked their own errors. They lost the brotherly love that Christ had enjoined, and saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. They did not realize that happiness and joy were going out of their lives and that having shut the love of God out of their hearts, they would soon walk in darkness. John, realizing that the brotherly love was waning in the church, urged upon believers a constant need of this love. His letters to the church are full of his thought. Beloved, let us love one another, he writes, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love and this was manifested the love of god toward us because the god sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love not that we love god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins or to be the means by which our sins are forgiven beloved if god so loved us we ought also to love one another so what is our responsibility to other church members is our relationship to Jesus Christ the only thing that matters in our Christianity? Can we just ignore everybody else? Or do we have a responsibility to other members of the church? What are the implications of brotherly love? It was a common belief among the fellow formerly Jewish Christians that doing certain ritual things, such as eating ceremony meals, even getting circumcised, was the way, way to improve your relationship with God. Even though he's a former Pharisee, the Pharisees, Paul, Paul said that all such approaches to God are merely fleeting and have no permanence. The grace that God offers is the only permanent way to a right relationship with God. Uh, and we're going to have to drop down. In places like Corinth or Rome, Rome, it was very common practice that meat and especially wine brought in the marketplace were first offered to things. And we'll close there. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of learning these lessons and understanding them so that we can, may become more like you. May that be our goal every day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.